Today on Listen to This, at writer Susan Stotterell, we'll begin where I left off in Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Last week, I read two sections of the forward material. One was entitled A Word of Explanation, and the other, How Sir Lancelot Slew Two Giants and Made a Castle Free. Today, I will be reading The Stranger's History, plus Chapter One, Camelot. The Stranger's History. I am an American. I was born and reared in Hartford in the state of Connecticut. Anyway, just over the river in the country. So I am a Yankee of the Yankees and practical. Yes, and nearly barren of sentiment, I suppose. Or poetry, in other words. My father was a blacksmith. My uncle was a horse doctor, and I was both. Along at first. Then I went over to the great arms factory and learned my real trade. Learned all there was to it. Learned to make everything, guns, revolvers, cannon, boilers, engines, all sorts of labor-saving machinery. Why, I could make anything a body wanted, anything in the world. It didn't make any difference, what? And if there wasn't any quick newfangled way to make a thing, I would invent one and do it as easy as rolling off a log. I became head superintendent, had a couple of thousand men under me. Well, a man like that is a man that is full of fight, that goes without saying. With a couple of thousand rough men under one, one has plenty of that sort of amusement. I had, anyway. At last I met my match, and I got my dose. It was during a misunderstanding conducted with crowbars with a fellow we used to call Hercules. He laid me out with a crusher alongside the head that made everything crack and seemed to spring every joint in my skull and make it overlap its neighbor. Then the world went out in darkness, and I didn't feel anything more, and didn't know anything at all, at least for a while. When I came to again, I was sitting under an oak tree on the grass with a beautiful and broad country landscape all to myself, nearly. Not entirely, for there was a fellow on a horse looking down at me, a fellow fresh out of a picture book. He was in old-time iron armor from head to heel, with a helmet on his head the shape of a nail keg with slits in it and he had a shield and a sword and a prodigious spear. And his horse had armor on too, and a steel horn projecting from his forehead, and gorgeous red and green silk trappings that hung down all around him like a bed quilt, nearly to the ground. Fair sir, will ye just, said this fellow, will I which? Will ye try a passage of arms for a land or lady or for... What are you giving me, I said. Get along back to your circus or I'll report you. Now what does this man do but fall back a couple of hundred yards, and then come rushing at me as hard as he could tear, with his nail keg bent down nearly to his horse's neck, and his long spear pointed straight ahead. I saw he meant business, saw I was up in the tree when he arrived. He allowed that I was his property, the captive of his spear. There was argument on his side, and the bulk of the advantage, so I judged it best to humor him. We fixed up an agreement whereby I was to go with him and he was not to hurt me. I came down and we started away, I walking by the side of his horse. We marched comfortably along through glades and over brooks, which I could not remember to have seen before, which puzzled me and made me wonder, and yet we did not come to any circus or a sign of a circus. So I gave up the idea of a circus and concluded he was from an asylum, but we never came to an asylum, so I was up a stump, as you may say. I asked him how far we were from Hartford. He said he had never heard of the place, which I took to be a lie, but allowed it to go at that. At the end of an hour, we saw a faraway town sleeping in a valley by a winding river, and beyond it on a hill, a vast gray fortress with towers and turrets, the first I had ever seen out of a picture. Bridgeport, I said, pointing. Camelot, he said. My stranger had been showing signs of sleepiness. He caught himself nodding now and smiled one of those pathetic obsolete smiles of his and said, I find I can't go on, but come with me. I've got it all written out and you can read it if you like. In his chamber, he said, first I kept a journal. Then by and by after years, I took the journal and turned it into a book. How long ago that was. He handed me his manuscript and pointed out the place where I should begin. Begin here. I've already told you what goes before. He was steeped in drowsiness by this time. As I went out at his door, I heard him murmur sleepily, Give you good den, fair sir. I sat bound by my fire and examined my treasure. The first part of it, 
The great bulk of it was parchment and yellow with age. I scanned a leaf particularly and saw that it was palimpsest. Under the old dim writing of the Yankee historian appeared traces of a penmanship, which was older and dimmer still. Latin words and sentences, fragments from old monkish legends, evidently. I turned to the place indicated by my stranger and began to read as follows. Chapter 1. Camelot. Camelot. Camelot, said I to myself. I don't seem to remember hearing of it before. Name of the asylum, likely. It was a soft, reposeful summer landscape, as lovely as a dream, and as lonesome as Sunday. The air was full of the smell of flowers, and the buzzing of insects, and the twittering of birds, and there were no people, no wagons. There was no stir of life, nothing going on. The road was mainly a winding path with hoof prints in it, and now and then a faint trace of wheels on either side in the grass, wheels that apparently had a tire as broad as one's hand. Presently a fair slip of a girl, about ten years old, with a cataract of gold hair streaming down over her shoulders, came along. Around her head she wore a hoop of flame-red poppies. It was as sweet an outfit as ever I saw, what there was of it. She walked indolently along, with a mind at rest, its peace reflected in her innocent face. The circus man paid no attention to her, didn't even seem to see her, and she, she was no more startled at his fantastic makeup than if she was used to it like every day of her life. She was going on by as indifferently as she might have gone by a couple of cows. But when she happened to notice me, then there was a change. Up went her hands, and she was turned to stone. Her mouth dropped open, her eyes stared wide and timorously. She was the picture of astonished curiosity, touched with fear. And there she stood gazing in a sort of stupefied fascination, till we turned a corner of the wood and were lost to her view. That she should be startled at me instead of at the other man was too many for me. I couldn't make head or tail of it and that she should seem to consider me a spectacle and totally overlook her own merits in that respect was another puzzling thing, and a display of magnanimity, too. That was surprising in one so young. There was food for thought here. I moved along as one in a dream. As we approached the town, signs of life began to appear. At intervals, we passed a wretched cabin with a thatched roof and about it small fields and garden patches in an indifferent state of cultivation. There were people, too, Brawny men with long, coarse, uncombed hair that hung down over their faces and made them look like animals, they and the women, as a rule, wore a coarse tow linen robe that came well below the knee and a rude sort of sandal, and many wore an iron collar. All of these people stared at me, talked about me, ran into the huts and fetched out their families to gape at me. But nobody ever noticed that other fellow, except to make him humble salutations and get no response for their pains. In the town were some substantial windowless houses of stone, scattered among the wilderness of thatched cabins. The streets were mere crooked alleys and unpaved. Troops of dogs and nude children played in the sun and made life and noise. Hogs roamed and rooted contentedly about, and one of them lay in a reeking wallow in the middle of the main thoroughfare and suckled her family. Presently there was a distant blare of military music, it came nearer, still nearer, and soon a noble cavalcade wound into view, glorious with plumed helmets, flashing mail, and flaunting banners, and rich doublets, and horse cloths, and gilded spearheads, and through the muck and swine, and naked brats, and joyous dogs, and shabby huts, it took its gallant way, and in its wake we followed. Followed through one winding alley, and then another, and climbing, always climbing, till at last we gained the breezy height where the huge castle stood. There was an exchange of bugle blasts, then a parley from the walls where the men-at-arms in Halbrook and Morion marched back and forth with halbert at shoulder under flapping banners, with the rude figure of a dragon displayed upon them, and then great gates were flung open, and the drawbridge was lowered, and the head of the cavalcade swept forward under the frowning arches. And we, following soon, 
found ourselves in a great paved court with towers and turrets stretching up into the blue air on all four sides, and all about us the dismount was going on, and much greeting and ceremony, and running to and fro, and a gay display of moving and intermingling colors, and an altogether pleasant stir and noise and confusion.' 